But uh, now Leticia will talk to us about anticoagulation, yes or no, in COVID uh, disease. We have some dilemmas. Is that uh, like this, uh, Leticia? Please. Thank you, Professor Antonio, for the invitation. So uh, I need someone to allow my video to... Oh, here we go. Let me share my screen. Do you guys see my screen? Yes, yes. yes okay okay so here we go thank you for the invitation for me it's an honor and a pleasure i'm going to discuss um quick points on anticoagulation in covid19 so i have no relevant conflicts of interest to disclose to disclose and first of all why are we discussing anticoagulation in covid19 so the first hint that uh, the coagulation system was involved, was significantly involved in COVID-19 came from the first reports from China, where cases of COVID-19, where in cases of COVID-19, it was observed in very elevated D-dimers, and, and those levels were associated with disease severity and death. Also, there was seeing moderately low platelet counts, elevated fibrinogen, and mild prolongation of prothrombin time. So following those first reports, uh, some autopsy findings showed us that uh, in COVID-19 lungs, we were seeing microthrombi in small pulmonary vessels. In a small autopsy series just published in the New England um, they compared COVID-19 lungs with uh, influenza H1N1, and they showed that uh, even compared with another uh, viral, severe viral pneumonia, there was more capillary microthrombosis and angiogenesis in COVID-19. In that uh, pulmonary intravascular coagulopathy, was uh, is hypothesized by some critical care physicians to be responsible for a somewhat different phenotype of patients where they present with hypoxemic acute respiratory failure but preserved lung compliancy, suggesting that the problem might not be of the gas exchange, might not be in the alveoli, but in the vasculature, in the pulmonary vasculature. This has been debated. Some other papers came out showing that in COVID-19, the respiratory mechanic phenotype is not all that different from typical a ARDS. But indeed, some patients, we do see that uh, severe hypoxemia and good compliance. Um, the, the fact is that the coagulation system is an effector of the immune response, and the end point of inflammation is thrombosis. And the reason for that is that uh, the, the end point of the coagulation system is to entrap microorganisms and uh, contain the infection. So this is how the things were designed from the scratch. Uh, but clinically, we see a hypercoagulability with COVID-19, and we've seen a high cumulative incidence of symptomatic uh, VTE, for example, in reports from Netherlands. And in this French report, we see that pulmonary embolism was, uh, the incidence was higher among critically ill COVID-19 positive as compared to COVID-19 negative patients. So it seems there seems to be an excess of uh, hypercoagulability in COVID-19 patients. We have also uh, seen in the literature uh, descriptions of ischemic stroke in young patients associated with COVID-19, but also hemorrhage and severe hemorrhage like uh, uh, sorry, of... Leticia, just to interrupt you, can you open your camera? It is a pity we don't uh, see you, your nice face. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I'm sorry, just a second. Yes. yes. Take your time. My video says that the host... Yes, oh, indeed. 
You see me now? Social media, yes, we want you here now. Great. Okay. And do you also see my, my PowerPoint images? Yes, everything's fine. Okay, so, so we've seen in COVID-19 thrombosis and bleeding. And, and this is an issue because what do we do with this information, right? As, as per June 2020, with all that we say, that, that we know about it. So about management. So we can call it an immune thrombosis, what we've been seeing in COVID-19, because it's thrombosis triggered by the inflammatory immunological response. And in those cases, the paradigm is to treat the underlying disease. That's what we know from all other scenarios that provoke immuno immunothrombosis. Uh, what about prophylaxis? So VTE prophylaxis for sure for all hospitalized patients, but there are still some points we don't know. For example, should we be using higher dose of VTE prophylaxis? I can tell you in my hospital, we are not using higher doses, uh, only in the cases that it's already well defined in the literature. What about extended duration? Should we be prolonging prophylaxis 14 to 30 days post discharge for higher risk patients? We also don't know this uh, based on evidence. So we really need to study that and that is studied soon. Uh, fortunately, we'll have more evidence-based answers. Same for anticoagulation. Should we anticoagulate a COVID-19 patient that has no VTE diagnosed only because of COVID-19 and some lab uh, coagul uh, coagulation abnormalities? We don't know because as we've been seeing, we have thrombosis, but we also have the risk of bleeding. So anticoagulation is a concept that is evolving with the randomized controlled trials. What I can say in Brazil, we have one trial in anticoagulation for COVID-19 is gonna start recruiting soon. And we hope with all this crisis we're living in Brazil, at least recruitment is gonna be very fast. Um, finally, my last words for patients already anticoagulated and then they catch COVID-19 infection. What should we do? For sure, we should check on interactions between off-label COVID-19 uh, drug prescriptions and patients anticoagulant, especially for antiviral. And for that, I refer you all for this excellent uh, reference that was published in Jack recently. It has a table with all the possible interactions and in the, in the suggested management for that interaction. Thank you. That was a Twitter-sized presentation. Thank you.